Alright guys, welcome back to the channel and today as you can see behind me we have the Ford Explorer that we're going to be taking the 5.0 liter V8 out of to put inside the 4.6 Mustang and uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take off this hood yeah and the reason why I'm taking off the hood instead of just propping it up is because the last time I was here and I started to work on it um, uh, I, we propped it up and somehow it just dropped right on me so we're not going to take that chance this time we're going to start by taking it off Alright, now that we have the hood off and to the side so that it doesn't get damaged, we're going to start tackling uh, everything that's on top of the motor, like the um, throttle cables, the wire harness, the air box, radiator, just basically stripping it down to the bare necessities. We just need the, um, the basically everything off of it and then we're going to pull it out. So um, I'll come back after I've done most of the work. Alright, so I got a bit carried away working and uh, I didn't have um, any help with recording the video today, so it's just me. I end up taking off the upper intake um, plenum or manifold, whatever you'd call it. And um, I'm about to remove the fuel injector rails. I don't have to disconnect any of the fuel lines, so just lay the, the um, injectors and the fuel rail to the side. And I took off the bolts underneath the motor mount that stick up into the engine um, because the uh, let me see if I could zoom in on it no you wouldn't be able to see it but um it was easier to loose the motor from the mounts itself instead of loosing the mount from the chassis so that's what I did and um radiator is out let me give you a shot in the front the radiator is out the um the clutch fan is still on power steering hoses I just cut those when I take the engine out I'll do a lot of prepping and getting it ready because this is a carbureted build it's not a EFI electronic fuel injection so most of the parts that are on here we don't even need like the electronic um, uh, cam sensor or whatever that is but um yeah so I'll continue taking it apart and give you guys updates as I go All right, so we have the fuel rail, all the injectors, the wire harness, everything out the way. Um, all rubber hoses are disconnected, heater core hoses disconnected, um, all engine grounds disconnected, uh, engine motor mounts, like I said before. Maybe I think there's one AC line down here that I have to disconnect, probably while I'm pulling the motor up. But if you look, I have the whole motor just rocking on the mounts. Um, I actually don't have my engine lift today, so I'll have to wait until tomorrow to get it So that's when we'll continue this video But for now, I'll just close this stuff up put the hood rest the hood back on top and we'll get back to it tomorrow Alright, so it's a bit windy. I hope you guys can hear me um, Basically, this is day two. I skipped ahead. I did a lot of work. Trust me. Uh, I'm really sorry I didn't get to record as much as I would like, but I ended up taking the engine out, as you can see, there's nothing left in the bay. And basically we have it over here on the ground, and it's going to need some cleaning up. It's got rust all over it, but I'm really hoping that we could salvage it and just basically uh, use it to beat on. It's just a junkyard build. 
we won't be going with these headers these are for the Jeep uh, we'll be getting the motor mounts as well and this oil that oil setup is not gonna be used either so we're gonna figure out a few things um, but basically the 5.0 is out which is the first part of my video and I'm gonna have several parts to this build uh, it actually is going to be carbureted so all of the fuel rail the injectors even this manifold is not going to be used again we have a carbureted manifold that we're going to be using we have a flywheel a clutch and a pressure plate all I have to do is buy my pilot shaft bushing and um, I should start putting everything together uh, most of the parts are out of the junkyard so in the build right now I have absolutely no money into it it's all been junkyard parts so if I do have to buy something what I'm gonna do is write it down and add it to the cost of what is in the car today we are going to be installing the carbureted intake and then installing all the um, carbureted parts and um, they're right over here I'm not sure what the specific name for this but I'll just call this a spacer it looks like it has I don't know what the hell that is but some type of mechanism on it this is the gasket for this this is the carburetor all pulled out of the junkyard nothing bought yet everything seems to be working on it throttle works uh, I just gotta figure out the um, vacuum diagram for it but um this as you can see all these parts are out of the junkyard pretty rusty the mating surfaces on them are good they're flat I just have to put silicone on everything silicone at the bottom of this manifold silicone on the base of this carburetor so that it doesn't leak silicone on both sides of this and then silicone underneath the carburetor I don't want any air leaks from the intake up so I'll get I'll start uh, putting on the silicone on the manifold and get it sitting on the motor bolt it down and then I'll come back and show you to you guys now that we have the carbureted manifold on and bolted down uh, some key tips is we already had um, intake gasket here I just wanted to make sure that it didn't leak so I put silicone on both sides of the manifold and hopefully that should make sure that we don't leak I noticed that whatever that spacer plate is has a gasket and the gasket is torn right here so I'm gonna fill this in with a little bit of silicone just uh, probably run some silicone around the whole thing just to make sure that it seals properly and then we're gonna mount the carburetor It's just that simple. Just a carbureted intake off of an old 5.0 in the junkyard. Old carburetor cleaned up. Might need to just um, 
get some carplane and spray it all over. I might need to get another gasket for this carburetor. This one is broken, but it's just a spacer. Hopefully not much air gets out of it. I need to now get a distributor for it. Uh, a vacuum advanced distributor to be exact. And start putting it together. The next video that I'm gonna do is gonna be in installing the flywheel, uh, the clutch and the pressure blade. Basically, I have an unboxing video for you guys on uh, two parts that came for me that are for the 5.0 swap. Uh, we're just going to get this one out of the way and then start with the smaller box first. And this is what I needed because I was going from uh, automatic 5.0 to using a standard shift 5.0, nothing else in the box. This is your pilot shaft bearing or bushing whatever you want to call it let me take it out of the bag for you guys i know it has a little bit of grease on it i'm trying to slip it out give you a better look at it all right there you go this goes into the back of the block of the 5.0 and it has some uh, races and bearings on the inside whatever you call them that the input shaft for the gearbox goes into and you need this when going from automatic to standard shift if I had a standard shift um, 5.0 that I pulled out of a vehicle I wouldn't need to have this because it would already be in the back of the block I love the link in the description below for this exact part all right on to the second one I've already opened both of them just to make sure that everything was in it this is what you need when you're going from EFI to carbureted and you don't want to go in your fuel pump to change your pump. Basically what this is, is an adjustable fuel pressure regulator. And this is a low PSI fuel pressure regulator. So this is gonna take your um, high fuel pressure and turn it into about eight PSI. That's what carburetors use. So it is adjustable, I can go anywhere. I believe it's from five to nine PSI, which is a small range, but that is what you need for carbureted. And let's get into unboxing it. These are just some block offs. I'll take one out so you can see. Let me see if I can get this open. This is a small little block off, has some threads on it so I knew it blocks off the pressure somewhere uh, I guess in case you don't want to use all of the openings that are on it you can um, put one of these in the specific areas or holes that it's supposed to go into and this should be fine all right let's go into this little white box gauge this is a fuel pressure gauge as you can see it goes from 0 to 15 that's how much PSI it goes to All right. let's put this to the side for now I don't want to mess this up I'm gonna need that when uh, tuning the fuel pressure and this should be my fuel pressure regulator it's a pretty generic one. Let me see if I can get a close-up on it. They're, they're fairly cheap. I'll have to link to this in the description as well. Basically, your fuel line is gonna come in here um, and then output on either side. Let me see if I can get a close-up. You see the outside there and then outside there. So I'll, I'll set it up for you guys before we leave, but this here, is how you're gonna adjust your fuel pressure right here and then you're gonna watch the gauge let's install this gauge okay so when you turn this in okay let's get it nice and tight so that, that gauge lines up I'm trying to get it right all right so gauge is installed not going anywhere Pressure comes in, gauge reads, sends back out to either side. Take this big uh, plug out, give you a look on the inside there, so I can get it in focus. And that's perfect right there. 
All right, let's take out one of the plugs, get it plugged, because we're not going to be using that side. I just noticed that the smaller plug is in case you don't want to use the gauge, which in, I don't see a reason not to use it. It's going to help you to figure out how much fuel pressure you have at any given time. The in plug just fell out. That's how it looks. It goes up. There's like a spring and a ball in there that helps adjust the fuel pressure. Let's put the cap back in. And like I said, we're going to have a fitting screwed in here and then a hose onto it. Fitting screwed in here and then a hose onto it going to the carburetor. Now what we're going to be doing today is we're going to go out, we're going to get the two fittings for the sides, get some fuel hose, just so that when we get back to uh, putting the 5.0 into the Mustang, we'll have everything we need to complete the swap. Also, just to explain to you guys, um, I think it's been a month since I've uploaded. Um, I ordered some parts the beginning of the year, January, and these are the only two parts to come, the fuel pressure regulator and the pilot shaft bushing. And we're still waiting on the distributor and solid motor mounts. So that's why I haven't been putting up any content, but hopefully I could get those parts soon. And we're gonna finish this 5.0 swap because it's fairly easy. So I'm going to go now, get the fittings, get the hoses, and show you guys how I'm going to hook it up on the car. Alright, so I just got back from the parts store, and just like I said, we're going to get the, we were going to get the fittings to run it on the car. This is where the fuel would go in, and this is where the fuel would come out to go to the carburetor. So, let me show you what I got here. I got about, uh, let's say, six foot of fuel hose let me see if I can figure out can't remember what size this is exactly but this is the number that's on the fuel line it's pretty tough stuff so got six foot of fuel line to go with it I got a bunch of little clamps to go on the end of the fittings and onto the fitting of the carburetor just to make sure everything is done properly or at least so uh, to minimize the risk of leaks. Okay, now the fittings. Uh, I wish I knew exactly what they were, but I had someone helping me pick them out. This is how they're going to look when it's all together. I don't think I could separate this one. That's why I didn't take it apart, but it's basically this fitting that goes into this one, like this. And then you take it, and you put it on, this would be the in, so you take it, screw it in the inside, and then you take your other fitting, screw it in the outside. And this is basically how it's going to look when it's on the car, because these two holes mount it to, the, to uh, whatever screws I want to use. That's how it's going to look, and then you're going to have a fuel line that comes from there's gonna be a fuel line that comes from there's a oh lord how do you say this there's a feed and a return line in the fuel injection system that feed um, hard line that comes up in the hood you're gonna put the end of this line onto it and you're gonna clamp those down have this one um, come to the inside it's gonna send that high pressure in here and then that low APSI of pressure that we need to go to the carburetor is going to come out of this side. You're going to put holes onto this side, clamp it down and send it to the carburetor and clamp it down again. And that is how you uh, basically do that EFI to carbureted swap without having to go in your tank and change that pump to the, to the low pressure carbureted pump. You know, it's really easy and uh, very inexpensive. I'll put the link to this in the description as well. But uh, that's basically how I'm going to do it. Probably in the next week or two, I'll be posting videos of me taking the engine and transmission out of the Mustang as it is now. And then we'll move on to um, installing the new 5.0 motor. Wow, this is on there pretty good. But much more videos to come. Uh, sorry, I haven't posted in like a month. But like I said, I was waiting on parts. That's the biggest thing about living in the Bahamas. Most YouTubers that do car channels, they, uh, they live right in the States. When parts are ordered, they get delivered right to their door. With me, they have to get delivered to a shipping service. 
and then that shipping service has to send it to um, the Bahamas and then I get it and then I pay for it again because we have to pay duty and all type of other taxes and then we get to um, receive the part so it's more time on our end to get anything into the country but we have this we have the uh, the bearing that goes into the back of the motor and we're just waiting on the distributor and the motor mounts and we should be good to go showing you how to install a pilot shaft bushing on a 5.0 basically you just need a 24 size uh, I think it's 24 millimeter socket an extension and a hammer so let's get to unboxing this very simple take the bearing out all right so this is the back of the block basically you're gonna take it you're gonna get it in there almost flush you're gonna put your socket on it, push it, push on it a bit, and you're gonna tap it in. You 
you don't have to hit it too hard it's gonna go in evenly you can actually use the, the socket itself but I rather use the, the extension Just keep gently tapping it until it's completely flush, flush all around. See it's going in. Basically almost in. There you have it. That's how you install a pilot shaft bushing into a Ford 302 5.0 liter V8. Today I'm going to be showing you how to install a flywheel on a 5.0 liter V8. Alright, so what you're going to need to install this flywheel is you're going to need a 3 quarters uh, socket so that you can install the bolts and you're going to need your engine if it's um, resting on something like how I have it on this tire you're going to need it up in the air so I'm going to jack this engine up and then we're going to continue from there alright so we have the engine jacked up uh, using the engine lift we're going to rest the flywheel on and then tighten the bolts in an X pattern to get it tightened right down uh, flush to the block This one right there looks about right. That doesn't sound good. And I just hand tighten two of these. I go down. That one's a bit rusty. By the way guys, uh, the reason why everything we're using is rusty is because we're using it out of the junkyard. Uh, I didn't even bother to clean this up. I'm basically going to let the clutch, when it uh, starts to rub on it, to clean it up. I know everyone uh, says you got to clean it up or whatever, but you really don't have to. Okay, installing the last bolt. Get them as hand tight as you can. And let's begin with this bolt. Okay, that one starts to pull. When you see it start to pull the flywheel, you can start on the opposite side. Alright, that one's starting to pull. Switch it up. Let's go top to bottom now. That one's starting to pull, let's go bottom. Let's go on top again. Let's go bottom. Now from this point, you just keep keep on tightening them until it comes down flush. Basically got them tight. What I'm going to do is I'm going to stand up now and I'm going to pull from this angle like in a snapping motion just to try and get them as tight as I can. As you can see by this my engine is turning over fine. Just 
on it. All right, guys, and there you have it. That's how you install a flywheel on a 5.0 V8 Ford motor. Today I'm going to be showing you how to install a clutch and a pressure plate on a 5.0 liter V8 Ford. What you're going to need to do this job is a 3 quarters uh, socket, doesn't matter the ratchet really, and a clutch guide tool. Alright guys, so you want to take your clutch and you notice that there's going to be a side that has uh, the springs poking out of the front of it and then there's basically almost a flat side so you want to take that flat side and put it against the motor put your guide tool in and basically the tip of that guide tool goes into your pilot shaft bearing and then you push the clutch as far onto the engine as you can now what you want to do is you want to take your pressure plate put it over the clutch like this you want to line up all your uh, dowel pins Mine's lined up just as yet. One moment. And there it is. Alright. What I usually do now is I'll use something heavy or a hammer and tap it on so that the pins get in properly before you start to screw them in. So I'll get a hammer and start tapping onto it. So there's some light taps. Shouldn't need a lot of force, shouldn't need a lot of force to go on. Alright, there you have it. Then you want to start taking your bolts, getting them in hand tight. I don't think these are the bolts. Nope, not the bolts. Okay. <laughs> Blooper reel. I'll go get the bolts. Okay, and I'm back and I have the right bolts, hopefully this time. And there we go. Just get them in there finger tight. Right, for for the clutch bolts, you're gonna need a 6.13 to install them. Let's try to get all as hand tight as we can. You don't have to do the hand tightening in any type of pattern because you're not pulling the disc down just yet. Just make sure that the clutch stays straight. Now that everything is on, you put it on your ratchet. Just go in an X pattern. It starts to pull down, go to the other one. That one starts to pull down, go to the other. Basically the same as if you were installing a flywheel. You'll, you'll notice that the, the fingers on the pressure plate will start to flex downward in the center as you tighten it down.
when everything is properly tightened down. You should be able to just pull out your clutch guide and the clutch doesn't move. And that's how you install a clutch and pressure plate on a 5.0 liter V8 Mustang. Alright guys, welcome back to the channel and today we're going to be removing the 4.6 liter V8 out of the Mustang in preparation for putting in the 5.0 liter V8. Now uh, what I'm going to start by doing is removing the wire harness, then I'm going to jack the car up, loose the trans mount, loose the motor mounts, um, what else? Uh, power steering lines have to come off and then I'll just pull the motor out all in one motion instead of uh, separating the trans and the uh, engine before taking it out. Take it out all in one piece makes it much easier on me. So let's get started with that. Well, guys, it's starting to rain, but I got a lot done. I got the wire harness completely disconnected, disconnected from the fuse box. Took the radiator out, took the radiator fan out. About to disconnect the AC hoses, uh, disconnect fuel hoses already. So basically, wire harness is uh, completely done, radiator gone, AC lines about to be gone. Um, I'm actually going to delete the entire AC system because we're not going to be using AC in this car anymore. Um, throttle body, um, throttle cable, my bad, disconnected. I have to go underneath now to disconnect the um, gearbox wire harness and the clutch cable and jack the car up, disconnect the motor mounts, disconnect the trans mounts, and then we should be ready to pull this thing. So let me keep going, or at least I'm going to have to wait until this rain stops. It's just sprying right now, but I don't know if it's going to come down any harder. So hopefully I get this motor out today, that way I can start cleaning up this engine bay. And getting to put the 5.0, which is right over there, inside the car. So, let's continue pushing on. Alright guys, well the rain is too off and on today. Like it's starting to slow down now, but it's just spraying too much. I'm getting too wet. Um, so I'm gonna call it a day. When we come back, only thing I have to loose is the high pressure hose for the power steering, the engine mounts, the exhaust, uh, the tranny mount, and probably the drive shaft. And good to go. Those things don't take very long. So hopefully I can pull this the next time we come back at it. We come back at it uh, day two probably tomorrow. So I'll be going.
Alright, so we finally got the engine out. That's all we're gonna be doing for today. Only thanks to this skeedy strong person right here, Whitson. Um, so 4.6 is out. Next video we're gonna be prepping for the 5.0 to go in. We lost all of our bright red or burgundy uh, tranny fluid. Oh man, it was a day, we got it out. We are going to be putting on the starter wiring harness on the 5.0 um, because that runs underneath the motor. We don't want to have to deal with that once the motor is already in. Then we are going to be installing the gearbox onto the 5.0, that's the bell housing there. Uh, putting on the motor mount, the trans mounts, and then we're going to get it into the car. And everything else should be from the top side um, after that. This is the gearbox now. We're gonna have to mate it to the bell housing. And then we're gonna have to put it on the motor. Won't be recording much of this today. If there's any specific part of this swap that you want me to show you guys, you can leave a comment uh, down in the comment section and I'll make a, a whole video on what you guys wanna see. So, I'm gonna get to work. I already bruised up my hand for the day. You know, all these engine builds require blood sacrifice, so. Let's get to finishing this up. Right. Oh, there I did it. Oh. 
hope you're gonna edit that shit out. So it's been a long hard day but the 4.6 was out from the last video now we have the 5.0 sitting inside the uh, Mustang um, we had issues with the flywheel where the box wasn't going over it so we're gonna have to order the right flywheel somehow I got the wrong one I have a clutch for it just need a need the proper flywheel for it so we're gonna call it quits for today. We gotta to order the right parts and then we'll get back to it. I can't even do any of the fueling or the hooking up of anything in the motor because we're gonna pull it back out, attach the trans to it, and then put it back in. So that'll be it for today. Uh, I hope this video doesn't come out looking like trash because I left my uh, uh, my stand for it home. So I'm just holding it at arm's length. Uh, today, uh, I'm gonna explain to you guys why it took me so long to put out the next video because the uh, 5.0 was already in but we have to take it right back out what the issue was is that I had a V6 uh, T5 flywheel which is actually a hundred and sixty seven tooth flywheel and I had to order the hundred and um, I think no this one is the 164 and this one is the 157 that I had to order so it took some time for the flywheel to reach and there it is let me see if I could get it out and open can't do anything with just one hand oh, man. Oh, this is heavy okay let's get this crap out the way and put that there so more crap to get out the way put all that over there and here is our new flywheel Ugh. and I'll show you now why we had to order it if I could get it out of this package and run out uh -oh. Ugh. sorry for the bad camera work guys but let me give you look now if you take a look at this you can see that this is the new where the new flywheel ends and this is where the old one ends the 157 tooth is a smaller flywheel the 164 is a bigger one and i needed a smaller one to work with the uh, transmission that i have which is a t5 
the world class T5. So this is really what was holding me up the entire time. Like I said earlier, I don't have my um, camera stick to set up the camera to record me and watch me work. Uh, the forecast for today was supposed to be crap. It's supposed to start raining around one o'clock. It's about nine o'clock now. So I really can't record a lot. I gotta pull this motor out, attach the flywheel to it, attach the tranny, put it back in the car. Um, I gotta do a few adjustments on the exhaust so that I'll have an exhaust when the car gets up. Uh, I gotta put a different drive shaft in because the T45 has a different spline output on their um, tranny and the T5 has a, a different spline as well so I have to put a different drive shaft in it. A couple of things um, to get done. What I really want to be accomplished with today is I don't have to pull this motor again. I want to take this motor out and put this tranny and motor in as one piece and get it all bolted up uh, with their mounts and not have to take it out anymore so that I could start on the fuel re pressure regulator. I could start on installing the throttle body, um, uh, clutch cable, all those different things. So I'll just continue doing what I gotta do and I'll try my best to record as I go. All right, so we have the motor suspended above the Mustang, which is extremely unsafe. So I just was mounting this um, brand new flywheel, mount the clutch and the pressure plate, then I'll pull it out of the vehicle, put it down on this tire, put the trans on it, and then put it back in the car. Seems like I'm having an issue with the starters. I'm not sure yet. It looks like this flywheel, the different tooth flywheels have a different uh, starter so i noticed that the flywheel that i had before was a 164 and this is the flex plate that came off of the back of the 5.0 which is also a 164 that means i need a um a different starter because the 164 tooth and the 157 that i have carry a different depth how far the starter goes into the t5 and it carries uh, a different um tooth so i need to order a starter again for this so that's even more parts we gotta wait on but i'll get as much done as we can today it's very easy to put a starter in once it's in the car so i'll just have to buy a starter um, after putting this in so i'll continue working guys and get back to you soon as i have it together all right so i have the t5 onto the 50 now this is the sketchiest thing i think i've ever done in my life i just uh, i didn't have any help with me today so i couldn't get the motor away from the car with the lift because uh, we're on rocks and stuff i couldn't pull it away and i believe that wheel for the lift down there um just jammed in that position so i only could have lift the engine out so we have the box on uh, we put the flywheel on we put the clutch pressure plate put the box on put the starter on wired it up and now i'm gonna try to spin the motor and trans around and sit it down in the car and then i have to jack up the back of the car install this uh, t5 drive shaft because i believe the t45 and the t5 have a different spline uh, if they don't that'll even be more perfect but we got this friggin rain brewing coming over from florida i'm in grand bahama so it's only about 64 miles between us and florida and i could already feel the rain coming down it's supposed to be a hundred percent chance so I'm just going to try to sit this engine and tranny in the car and if it starts to come down harder, I'm going to leave. So hopefully I get something done. Alright guys, uh, yeah, as you can see it is freaking pouring. I got the T5 in, I got the 5.0 back in. I had to remove the motor mounts just to get, uh, get it to fit. But um, I just have to jack up the T5 so that I get the motor level and then hoist up the engine the same time so that I could get those motor mounts back in. The biggest issue today was that I didn't have any help to help me to do two to three things at the same time, but hopefully I have that help when I come back tomorrow and we can get this thing bolted up. Then we can start working on the fuel, fire, and uh, drive shaft, other little small things, radiator. But this is all for today. I hope this video came out well. I know it's friggin' a lot of rain on the camera right now. I hope it survives. Today, we have just a few things to get finished with when it comes to the Mustang. Uh, let me give you a look at it now, how it sits in the car. It's actually sitting, um, it's resting on the floor because the gearbox is resting on the floor. We took the motor mounts out uh, just to get the motor in before that rain came down in the last video. 
but today we're gonna put the tranny up we're gonna mount that to the car first and then we're gonna do the engine mounts and we should be good to go uh, we have a drive shaft to install as well I just want to get all the hard stuff in place and then I'll tow the car home get it out of the yard and um, finish it up um, when I get home because it's only the distributor uh, fuel and a couple of wires uh, for the distributor the fuel pump the alternator just some small things carbureted is a pretty easy setup so we're gonna start to finish up all the hard stuff today all of the braces the mounts and then we'll move on from that all right guys we done work the whole day away we got everything done though um, the engine mounts are in and bolted up the t5 transmission is in and bolted up uh, my friend right over here Shane he had to go and um, notch the just uh, open up the holes for the brace a little bigger so that we could get the t5 mounted with that solid brace so um, because we have all solid motor mounts under here everything is bolted up we just dropped the drive shaft off to a shop to get shortened by an inch uh, we had to shorten it so that they could get in and then I'm gonna start doing all of the fueling the distributor all of the things that we need to get it running uh, in the next video so it's bolted in and it's up so today oh lord the sun is in my eyes hold on all right today we're gonna be working on the Mustang um, I have an issue with my carburetor I didn't actually hook up anything yet no fuel I didn't hook up the distributors yet my carburetor is out of the junkyard and rusty like normal uh, I have to loose the four bolts that hold it down lift it back up and just spray WD-40 on the the throttle flaps and see if I could get it to move back and forth I had to do it while it was off but you know if a motor isn't running it's gonna seize back up eventually um, the point of the build is just to see what I could have made out of a junkyard for the least possible price uh, right now all I have in it is a flywheel uh, what else a distributor uh, what else uh, fuel pressure regulator um, pilot shaft washing really relatively cheap stuff and hopefully we can have it at least cranking if not running by the end of the day so I'm gonna start taking off this uh, carburetor let me show it to you that's it right there she has about four bolts on each side I mean she has one on each side but um, four bolts gonna loose those gonna take that back off and then I will be installing my fuel pressure regulator and running fuel to my carburetor then we're gonna do the spark and then I'm gonna get a battery and see if that starter that we put in is the right starter I believe that's the wrong one um, that's what I was told online that the starter for the automatics won't work for the standard shift but we're gonna see um, so let me start setting up so I can take this carburetor off All right guys, so the bolts for the carburetor are held on by a 13 millimeter bolt. A nut, I believe. I don't know what the hell that is. I'm really not a professional at all. <laughs> I'm a guy that has available tools and junkyard parts. So I'm gonna be taking these bolts off so we can get the carburetor off and I can try and clean up that throttle. And then when I install that, I'm gonna be installing the fuel pressure regulator at the same time. I don't think I don't think you should ever bolt down your carburetor too tight. I'm not sure what it'll do or if it if it'll seat properly or if it wouldn't seat properly. But eh, not too tight. All right, so I got that one. Let's take up.
throttle. I've cut the carburetor off. Um, these are the throttle plates now that I'm talking about that uh, just don't want to move. Pretty frozen. Oh, there we go. Got them to open, but you see, it stays open. So I'm gonna just try and massage them and clean them up, and hopefully we can get them in good working fashion in no time. Alright, so to get started on cleaning up that throttle, even though it started to open up with a little bit of force, I am going to flip this carburetor over and expose those throttle plates and they seem to be coming open but it was sticking a bit. These are, whilst I'm doing this I'm also going to be setting my air to fuel ratio, air to fuel mixture by screwing these in all the way and then backing it out two full rotations I was I read that that's a pretty good like a base map or a base mixture to start with so that's what we're gonna do we're gonna first gonna get a little bit of WD-40 on those plates on the throttle itself just grease it up get it moving it's pretty rusty Get it moving, just keep massaging it. Oh yeah, now, you know this is snapping shut. Oh yeah, there you go. There we go, perfect. All right, that is beautiful. And you wanna make sure when your throttle opens that, oh, what is this? Uh, oh Lord, I don't wanna call it the wrong thing. I know it's a pump. It's a mechanical pump that when your throttle opens, it, pr it pushes more fuel. So you want to make sure that that's also working. It looks like that's working in really good fashion. So we're going to get to those mixture screws now. And I want to flip it over for this. I'll show you guys just like this. Turning it all the way in. All the way in. Okay, that is all the way in. This one is all the way in. And I was told, you notice they're both pointing at like uh, one or two o'clock. Now I'm going to spin it once, all the way back, so that would be half a turn, that's a full turn, that would be another half a turn, that's a full turn. So two turns backwards after being all the way in, so half a turn, full turn, half a turn, full turn. So they both should have a pretty good set base on it now and then we'll tune it as we go along, but now that throttle response is perfect. So we're gonna reinstall this, we're gonna wipe it off, reinstall it. I was even thinking about if I should keep this electronic choke. I'm not sure what that's really good for. I think it's just to warm the car up, which in the only time we're gonna be in this Mustang is when we're beating the crap out of it. So whether it's warm or cold, we're gonna be redlining it. So I'm not sure if I should keep that. I see a few guys just delete it and set their mixture to, I guess, whatever weather they're having. And they're good, so we're gonna get back to putting this on the car. All right, um, time to install this. And uh, hopefully the throttle doesn't seize up anymore. Let's put that first bolt in, line it up with the one over here. And what, I'm go what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to get this down as evenly as possible. Hopefully this bolt catches. That one is down. And you just keep doing it like a tire, like how you would go opposite, that bolt's opposite. Okay, now it's back on. Throttles. Something has to be jamming this throttle. 
Might just be an issue where this carb was too tight. Yep, the car was working fine now. Hmm, that's strange. Well, this is my first carburetor car. I don't know much about them, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to snug them a quarter turn each until the throttle becomes to get tight again, and then I'll leave it there. I can live with that, that's pretty good. Alright guys, um, as you can see, we had the carburetor off. It, it seemed to be an issue with that gasket, even though my gasket is all torn up. That centerpiece where the flaps are is the only thing that needs to be airtight. So that is airtight. Um, so we got this cleaned up. I still haven't made a decision on if I'm keeping this electric choke or not. Um, in the next video, I'm gonna be installing the uh, fuel to get fuel to deliver from the fuel tank out to the carburetor. And then I'm gonna be installing the distributor. And then we're going to be doing wiring and hopefully be able to start this bad boy up. Dang, my hands are freaking dirty. And today uh, we are going to be uh, finally putting this fuel pressure regulator together. Uh, several things you're going to need. These fittings I had to pick up from a local hardware store. The hose as well, the Teflon tape, and these wrenches I had in my toolkit. Now, set some of these things aside so we can get started there how this one this regulator works is that it has one in one and two outs I think this was for a return style um, what you call it fuel pressure regulator but I'm gonna be using fuel in and just fuel out because my carburetor doesn't have a return style so I'm gonna take this plug out for right now I'm going to wrap it in Teflon and put it in. That's what we're going to do with all of our fittings. We're also going to be installing the fuel pressure gauge. I'm going to be putting Teflon on that as well. So my fittings are one that go into each other. So I'm going to wrap this. How you wrap Teflon is the way that you need to spin the bolt or the nut to tighten it. That's how you wrap it. You would wrap it going in the same direction. Let me see if I could demonstrate this for you guys. So, just like I said, if you were to pick it up, or at least let's pick it up from the other side so that the wrap stays tight, you would pick it up and the way that you're going to be tightening, tightening this down, that's the way that you're going to put it on. So, you're going to roll it in a tightening motion, just like this. And you don't need too much, even this what I have on it now is a bit overkill. But I don't want any leaks, and you don't want to cover that port with the Teflon. So I'll open that back up, and then you take whatever fitting you're using, and you'll notice now, notice it's spinning in, and it's not um, unseating the Teflon. That's what you want. That's what you want. Now I'm going to take my wrench, put it on that side, take this one. Put it on this side and just turn it until I feel like it's tight or that it's not going to leak. Uh oh, this wrench is slipping. Okay, let's turn this now. Alrighty. Give it a few more turns just to get it nice and tight. If it does leak on the car, I'll just tighten it up some more. But just giving you guys the gist of what I'm doing here. And so that is tight. And now you're gonna do the same for the next piece. What you're gonna do, you're gonna take the Teflon and wrap it. So just like I said, in the direction that you're going to be screwing it with, you're going to um, wrap it. So make sure you get all the threads so you don't have any fuel leak. Kind of wrap this one pretty bad, but it'll be fine. Pop that. Make sure your hole is clear, like I said. 
You want to be able to see straight through. And now we're going to do that infinite first. So just catch that one thread. And now we're going to go to using this wrench and just screw it in. There you have it. Just like that. You're going to start to get a little tight. Just give it a, about a quarter, half a turn after it gets tight. And that's how I'm going to be doing the other fitting. Uh, the same thing with the plug. So I'm going to get this done and then I'm going to meet you guys outside on the car and show you how I'm going to mount it on the wheel well. Uh, not the wheel well, on the outside by the shock tower. Uh, have it close to where it needs to go. And then show you guys how I'm going to run the fuel lines. Because we're going to be using a stock fuel pump for an EFI which is way too high of a pressure to use on this car with a carburetor. So this is going to step down that high pressure to a low pressure and like I said guys you're gonna uh, I'm gonna get done with making this uh, work and I'm gonna meet you guys outside alright guys uh, just got done installing the fuel pressure regulator I was going to install it on the face here of the shock tower but the headers would have been right on it so I put it on the front here uh, this will be the feed line that comes from the hard feed hose right here and then it's a returnless carbureted system so I have this side of the pressure regulator blocked off and then we have the feed going into the carburetor and that's all it takes to drop down your stock um, EFI pressure from the fuel tank down to the proper fuel pressure that this motor and this setup needs. We are going to be installing this HEI distributor which is needed to run a carbureted setup and these are the instructions. What I'm going to show you is how to properly read instructions. Yeah, that's how you do that. So what we're going to do is we're going to pop this hood, we're going to set this motor to top dead center uh, on that number one cylinder and we're going to stop this distributor and hopefully I get it right the first time which I'm probably not going to but let's get into the video alright guys um, I jumped ahead I took out that uh, number one spark plug and I tried to turn the motor over by the crank bolt it would not spin now I don't believe that this motor is locked up because I got it to spin from the back of the flywheel even when I was out the car I couldn't get it to spin from the front so I'm just assuming that's from either rust or sitting up too long. What I did was I connected the starter and I'm gonna try and um, crank the car from the starter. <sighs> it's highly likely that it won't work, but we'll see what happens. All right, hold on. Oh, wheel's locked. Nothing. Not a thing. All right, not getting anything from it. Not a thing. All righty. I don't know how to get this to bump now. Oh, that's because I have the, um, I have this computer still hooked up and that anti-theft thing is, is going off. So, all right, I gotta figure that out and then I'll continue the video. Alright guys, so I figured out why it wouldn't start. It seems like I have the right starter. I'm hoping so. Uh, there's this wire that comes from the other side. Uh, you know there's a positive and then you put the negative on the motor. And then there's this wire that was connected to a ground. It seems like you have to connect this one to a, a hot when you swap it to, I guess from the automatic to this one. So it's, it's rolling over fine now. I'll just have to run this to a switch and then from the back side of that switch, I'll have to run it to the positive, turn my key on, and then flip that switch so I can start the car. So I'm getting it to roll over. I'm gonna see if I can get it to roll over with the ratchet now that it's, uh, I guess, moving. If not, I'll just have someone to roll it until I feel that compression come from that number one, and then I will stab the distributor. All right, guys, uh, just turning on this light so I can show you that I'm at top dead center. There's the little indicator there, and there is the zero. And what I did is the same way that I was cranking it before, 
I just uh, put my finger over this uh, number one plug hole and I held the starter wire. Where the hell did it go? Oh, I held the starter wire and just cranked it until uh, I touched the starter wire onto the battery until it cranked, until it reached top dead center. Um, so now I am going to be stabbing the distributor and once the uh, the rotor cap points directly to this number one cylinder I should be good to go and then I should wire it up and hopefully then I could wire up the fuel wire up the distributor and that's all I will need just to get an initial start that's if it even starts up like I said you know junk junkyard motor so who knows what it's gonna do but let's continue pushing on all right guys I took the cap off of the um, distributor I have it set to if you look it'll run right down and point like a little after this number one cylinder looks like it's a little after I don't know if I have to set that again but I'm gonna go with that for now and whatever what I wanted to show you is how you find your number one is when you rest your cap on when you rest your cap on whichever pin is closest to this cap which is this one right here will be your number one cylinder that's where your number one wire would come from I'm gonna now stop recording and wire up these oh, spark plug wires and then probably get some fire to this distributor and see what we can get out of it if that timing is close enough or if I have to stab it again and try again but before I even try to crank it again I'm gonna have to get my fuel pump pumping so that when I crank it I could at least hear to see if it's trying to run or what it's doing so I'll get that all buttoned up alright guys we lost a lot of light I had to go and get some spark plug wires some connectors to attach my battery wire in here for this connector right here for the tack on the battery and then I had to get some ATF for the gearbox and then a seal for the back of the tranny just to make sure that it doesn't leak so I'm gonna try set the timing and then I think I'm gonna call it a day I get the fuel pump running tomorrow and yeah got a lot done today pressure regulator fuel pressure regulator is hooked up distributor should be hooked up by the end of the day <sighs> let's keep on pushing all right guys I know it's not been the first time that I've been wrong on this channel but I had this number one thing all wrong you need to aim your rotor cap at where the number one plug would go on the distributor I marked it right here with a little uh, X I don't know if you could see that but um, I have it uh, going right where it needs to be and I'm gonna put the cap back on and put the wires on and I think I'm gonna call it a day guys so because I'm losing light so Let's get those wires on and that'll be it for me. Alright guys, I got the distributor pinned down. I know it's at number one. I got it a bit slack so that when I come back tomorrow and I hook up the fuel, I can, I guess, play with it to get it started or hopefully get it started. But um, that's it for today. Uh, we installed the HEI distributor. Today we are in the Mustang. I'm going to be installing a few switches somewhere in the center console. Um, I was thinking about just taking this out, the coin part, and installing the switches right at the back. So I'm going to drill some holes in the back of this, install my button, my two switches, and pop it right back in so that um, only I will know, well, you know, the switches are here and the button because they won't be in plain sight. Um, and hopefully they look nice in the back there so let's get to making some holes in that and the switches uh, the function of these switches are for fuel distributor and starting the car so let's get into today's video guys all right guys now that we are inside I have the drill with the proper drill bit that I want these are just uh, normal off and on switches. I just put a uh, wire from the distributor or wire from the fuel pump and then a hot to the other side. And that's how they're gonna work. So, two switches, one for the distributor, one for the fuel pump, and then the button is for the starter. You just press it and it starts the cut. So, um, 
I was thinking about putting them in like this, but then I noticed that uh, it might be a bit difficult to toggle, use the toggles. So I might just use it backwards, install it backwards, and put the toggles and the button on the outside. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm now gonna drill the holes and come back when I'm done with that. All right guys, excuse the mess on the table, just got done doing it. Uh, instead of installing it face in like how it came out, I'm gonna flip it around and push it in, I guess force it in, and uh, I'll be uh, uh, running the wires to it before I actually install the switches like this but this is basically the simplest setup turn your fuel on distribute on hit the starter button and she should start right up once you have the key in the ignition all right uh, I'm gonna go now and wire this up uh, that part is actually gonna be unique to every car that does this so we're not gonna be using the same wires so I'm going to skip that part in the video, but I'll come back once everything is run and uh, show you the final product. Alright guys, I've been going at it all day, but I finally got it wired up. This might not be the desired place for it because the stick has to come up here, but I might relocate the stick further back uh, using a bracket and this should be fine. This one is for fuel, spark, and then you start it. But None of these get power unless the key is on. What we can do is turn on the spark, turn on the fuel. And yeah, so <laughs> still a far away from having a tuned car because of the um, because of the uh, carburetor leaking. I'm pretty sure. Yep, there's a puddle of fuel right there. So with the leaking, we're not gonna get anywhere. I'm probably gonna have to order one because uh, it's more effective to it's more cost effective to order one than to rebuild this one. It's a hundred dollars brand new, forty dollars for a rebuild kit, and then you gotta spend all the time rebuilding it. Looks like it's leaking right out the top hat and at the bottom here. But as you just heard, guys, it starts up, so we definitely have a, a, a running moto, that's for sure. And uh, it's been such a long day. Today, I'm just gonna be updating you guys on what's been going on with the Mustang, what progress that I've made, and what issues that I've run into. But to begin this video, I am going to be showing you guys a piece of equipment that I bought for my YouTube channel to record better videos and that is, I'm going to try to pronounce the name, Lavilar or Lavilar Mic. I just got a little lav mic. Um, let me show you guys what it is. Got it in this small pouch, doing this with one hand, so excuse the camera work. So a little mic that you can plug into a phone. I'm going to use this uh, S7 as my recording device. Comes with um, two more air muffs, uh, not air muffs, uh, wind boots or wind socks or whatever. A conversion piece to hook up to a computer, but we're not going to be using that. So I'm going to get this all set up and then we'll start again. We'll start the video and see the difference in audio quality. So let go. Okay, so now we have the mic set up and I have it right here on my shirt. Kind of pulls it down a bit, but if it's for better audio quality, then it's going to be a sacrifice that we're going to make. I'll just walk you guys around the car and tell you what all I've done and see what is left to be done. Okay, let's start under the hood. We first got this... Uh, power steering line hooked up but it's actually um, for a 4.6 and it doesn't go all the way down into a 5.0 power steering line so I'm gonna have to source one of those uh, this is my Jimmy rigged spring for the throttle body to close it back because the, the spring here keep kept breaking at a metal point so I had to 
tape it to this tie strap that's uh, on the distributor. But it works, works just fine. Uh, we have two water leaks also, one right here under this uh, elbow and then one in the back of the motor. Um, what else, what else? We got the alternator somewhat wired up. <laughs> um, it works though. Um, we changed the oil filter. We put fresh oil in the motor. Believe it or not, I know you guys are gonna laugh, but the spark plugs that are in this uh, Mustang while it's running is the spark plugs that sat in it for about six seven years into the in the jeep that it was in in the ford explorer these are the exact same spark plugs so <laughs> i wanted to see if it would work so i guess it did but hmm, we're so close to being done with this build um we got the drive shaft in the stock drive shaft for a 3.8 T5 Mustang, that's this body shape. Uh, the 3.8 drive shaft is the one that we use. It comes with the same um, T5 as a 5.0. And we had to shorten it one inch for it to fit in this car. I'm not sure why. I don't, I don't know if that had anything to do with the mounts that we use. We end up using solid mounts, solid motor mounts. Let me see if I get you guys a shot of that. And basically, it's just gonna help the car to stay rigid and um, not move around a lot when beating on it. It didn't give me, I thought it was gonna shake you to death when you uh, started the car and you ran it, but it doesn't shake at all. Um, all right. I guess only thing left for me to show you guys is the car actually running. So I'll get in the seat now and show you guys how it works. Okay, so I don't think it's going to start one shot, but hopefully it does. But before we get into starting it, um, just remember that we had another issue. The clutch cable and the clutch fork from a 4.6 is what we used. And it doesn't give you the proper distance for engaging and disengaging the clutch. So what I'm going to do is most likely I'm gonna order the proper clutch cable and order a firewall adjuster so that we can adjust the tension of the clutch and the working area of the clutch. Um, before we do that though, I'm gonna get some washers and try to shim the end of the cable down by the box so that we get the proper tension on it so that it can be used in the meantime. But this is the process of starting the Mustang. You take the key, turn it on. Oh, just lock the wheel. All right, so keys on, switches, fuel, spark, make sure we're in neutral. And there you go. Up. Oh, she's behaving badly. Let me give her a few pumps of fuel at the carburetor. All right. she doesn't want to start so let me give her a few pumps again I didn't get to tune this carburetor properly yet just because we had those water leaks so I couldn't uh, uh, let it warm up to set even the timing we haven't set the timing yet with the time and light we just have it at top dead center and we turn the distributor a little advanced to get it to start so nothing is tuned right now the timing isn't on and the fuel isn't right because we didn't get to set the timing when it was warm so we're gonna have to fix that water leak before we can even set this time in. But there you go, shut right back off. Let's see if I give her a few pumps at the carb again. She idles though. Once you get it to start, she does idle. She idles at about a thousand RPM. Let's see if I can get it to start now. This, this tone is way off. It doesn't want to, I guess, crank up right now. Almost, let me give it a few more. All right guys, sorry about that. My uh, camera ran out of uh, storage. I tend not to delete anything off of it, so I have like years old footage on it. Just deleted some couple of things. And we're gonna continue with the video now. Uh, we were trying to get the Mustang started. I was giving it a few pumps of fuel. Turn the key on. 
that, that should be enough. Turn the fuel on, spark. And she shuts off. Give it a few more pumps. Um, yeah, let me just give it a few more pumps. Hopefully it gets started this time. Nope. And she started. And she died. I think, like, just like I said, this just isn't tuned right. There we go. Uh, yeah, she just isn't tuned right. Um, hopefully we get to set that um, that uh, timing with a timing light soon, and then we will be able to take it on runs and warm it up, uh, fix that coolant leak, so that we can let the car get warm set the timing and then set the um, carburetor to the air to fuel mixture that we want. Yeah, she has to be way too lean right now. But when I do get her started and she catches that idle, she has no problem holding it. So it's most likely an issue where uh, it's either set too lean or too rich at cold starting. But once it gets a little bit of temperature, it holds that idle properly. We don't have any exhaust on it. That's just uh, open headers. Like I said, when we uh, when we get to working on it again, I'm gonna uh, fix the clutch cable, fix that uh, coolant leak, and um, hopefully put the exhaust on so that it comes out the back. Uh, the exhaust is just gonna be a straight pipe to the mufflers, which I believe are factory mufflers. Uh, so it won't be anything special, but it'll be uh, modern enough for what we're doing. We don't really have a high output carburetor, but uh, like I said, she does idle. She does start up, but there is a uh, much needed tuning to left to be done to it. And um, the clutch cable needs to be replaced with an adjustable one. And I think that's about it. But. Um, the alternator works, so I'll take the battery off to show you. Oh, and now I'm embarrassed. I guess the alternator doesn't work. But... Let me check on that. It might be just a wiring that we did yesterday. Um, it's not 
really hooked up. I don't want to say it isn't, but it isn't really hooked up. I just pushed um, a wire that's a, uh, this is a wire that I just pushed down in this connector that runs to the same wire that adds power to the distributor. And what I did is I pushed it down in there so that it makes contact with the three terminals that are down there. But now that I am here, I'm looking at that it's not touching. So let me use my keys and try to push them back on and see if I can show you guys that the distribute, I mean, that this alternator is working. I'll just probably strip that, uh, cause I have this connector down at the junkyard where we got this uh, emoter from. So I'll just probably take that connector and splice into those three wires the same hot and we should be good to go. But let's see if it works this time. Just gonna start it up. Now you know the alternator works. I just have to get that uh, connector for it. Um, really guys, it's it's been a long, I would say build or journey to get this done, but the engine is in, the gearbox is in. Obviously it's a junkyard motor with a junkyard intake manifold and a freaking junkyard carburetor. So it's not gonna run the best initially. Uh, like I said, we still have to tune that distributor. We have to tune the carburetor as well. So it's gonna be it's gonna be a while before we get it tuned properly, but I believe we're gonna get there. We are going to be fixing just a couple minor things uh, on the Mustang, and I know you're wondering what are these. Uh, this is a spring that I'm hoping will fix my uh, uh, throttle spring problem. It's bit it's eaten up, but I hope this isn't too strong of a spring. So we'll put that on and see how that works out. I know you guys remember from the last video that the alternator was wired up just by pushing a wire down in it. Uh, this is the connector that goes into the alternator. So I'm just gonna strip these two ends and connect that red wire to this and then plug this in properly so that it's always on. Uh, the clutch cable needs to be shimmed. So what I did is I got some washers. Uh, I got about 10 of them. I got some washers, uh, not that thick. That's why I got 10 and I made a small slit in the side of them so that it can get past the cable but I got it with a, such a small hole that it doesn't get past uh, the hole that's at the back so you slide these in behind the cable uh, put them in between the cable and the fork uh, so that the cable gets stretched out even further and hopefully that changes the engagement area of the clutch and gives me the right engagement or at least the right tension on the cable that the clutch works properly. So the first thing we're gonna do is, uh, because the clutch cable adjustment, I'm gonna make that underneath the car, we're gonna do the spring and this connector first. So let's get under the car. All right, so we're gonna start by just taking this wire out of this connector. Probably gonna need my knife to move those prongs back into the right position. Let me grab my knife because I'm sure that I bent those already. So let's bring these prongs back into their original position and see if the clip goes down onto it. All right, that should be, oh, going too far over. All right, that should be close enough. So it goes on like that and it's secure. And now we're gonna strip these two wires connect it to this, uh, yeah, strip these two, connect it to this, and just use electrical tape for now. So, let me use some pliers for that. And just pull it, there you go, expose the wire. And pull it, there you go, expose that wire. 
Now, obviously this is not the professional way to do it, but just like every other thing you guys have seen on this channel, this is <laughs> not really a good demonstration for um, doing things the proper way. This is actually a demonstration for doing things a very cheap way. So just roll those wires together. And then even after spinning them together, you just bend this in half and lay it back down over the wire so that when you tape it, it stays together. So let's get some electrical tape on it. Okay, that should do the job. Later on in this video, I'll start it up and uh, check to see if the alternator is still charging like it was in the prior video. Probably gonna have to shorten this wire or tuck it somewhere, but just doing a few things to clean this up. That should be it for the alternator. Let's move on to the spring on the throttle body. Okay, so first let me point out uh, the spring that I was talking about. That would be this one right here. It's really just too weak. It's been, it's broke on me several times. I have it taped to a tie strap. And if you notice, if I pull on it enough, it pulls right off. Uh, the function of this is just to pull that throttle body when you open it, that it comes back shut so that you idle properly. Uh, hopefully this spring that I have works. Well, let's put it on. Just slide it right in here to this hole and let's get this tape off of the um, off of the tie strap I want to expose that loop that's at the end of it so that we can just put the um, put the thing I'm right in it oh there it is you can't really see it but this is a tie strap that has a loop on the end of it Put it on the tie strap first. Okay, hold on. All right, there it is. It's on the tie strap. Now it's on the throttle body. Throttle body is closed. A little tight, but I think that's better than it being loose. And that's all I have to do for installing that spring. Let's see how it looks if I was to press the throttle in the car i want to see how it feels that's me pressing it in the car it actually feels really great it feels perfect actually and i got that spring from one of my uh, friends named shane he took it off of one of his corollas uh, it was for the brake pedal so that's a <clears throat> brake pedal spring works perfectly as the uh, spring for the throttle body so on to the last thing for us to do which is to shim that uh, cable and see if we could get some type of clutch working properly in this car all right guys have the car jacked up one jack stand under it and um, we we're trying to adjust that clutch with those shims and i got it working i didn't record it uh, initially because it was hard to record under here but this is a 4.6 fork and a 4.6 cable on a t5 it took about four of those washers that I put a slit into it to give me any um, working clutch area but it works fine now I am going to jump in the uh, Mustang now and show you that it works hopefully I could get it on camera because the car is still leaning so it's kind of hard to record like this so make sure it is in neutral key on and she starts okay what I'm gonna do I'm gonna push the clutch in put it in reverse it took the gear I'm gonna show you that it comes back down that it uh, rolls stay there just roll roll again first 
And there we go. Back in neutral. Turn the key off. And there you go, guys. We just got done with uh, everything that we were supposed to do today, which was fix that spring on the throttle plate. So it seems to be working just fine. I don't know if I have something smoking on this side. Oh no, it's just from the headers. It's fine. Yeah, but we got that throttle cable done. We got the clip for the alternator, so that's working. And we got clutch engagement. So we got a lot done today. I'm still using that uh, new mic. Uh, last video, I noticed that it was giving me a bit of static feedback because um, I had the phone that I was using to record with in my back pocket. And what that did is, I guess, when it made contact with me, uh, it got a lot of static feedback. So I have a shirt on, cover all on, have it in the top pocket. And we're gonna see how this audio comes out today. And that's it for today. show you guys this little knob which is my um, manual choke system that I installed on the carburetor and I want to show you the new carburetor that I had um, installed on the 5.0 let's go around to the engine bay and it's shiny there it is right there that's a new motorcraft two barrel uh, it usually comes factory or stock on a 5.0 uh, that came from like, a, I think it was a 1982 truck or something like that. It's not going to be the most powerful, but it is going to get a job done. And it's supposed to keep uh, close to factory fuel mileage. And that's my phone ringing. All right, uh, continuing with what I was saying, uh, it's going to keep close to stock fuel mileage. Um, not that I was concerned about that. It's a drift car. You're not going to be trying to get every bit of mileage out of it 
but the throttle spring was another issue I had. I had to rig it with a spring from a brake pedal, I believe from a Corolla. Two tie straps so that when you press it, that spring opens up and then when you let it off, it goes back to its natural state. Even the throttle cable had to be jimmy rigged to work. So I have a bunch of tie wire around it, just basically holding it fast to the throttle body. And then I have some tie wire around the base of it, holding it in the proper position so that that cable stays at a good angle. But um, enough talking, let me show you how that uh, choke system works and uh, show you how the new carburetor sounds. The way that this works is that when you have it pushed all the way in, like it is now, it, it has the butterfly on the top um, wide open so that the air to fuel ratio mixture is changed. Um, to close it, you have to first push your foot down three quarters of the way and pull this out. Doesn't move very much, but it pulled out. And now, when you turn the key on, just wait for that beeping to stop. Turn on your spark, your fuel, let that catch up, and there you go. And she died. So I'm gonna give her a few pumps of the gas. One, two, three, four, five. to the pedal. There you go. I want to show you guys what will happen if you uh, push in the cable. When you push it in, it brings that idle right down. When you pull it out, it, um, it brings your idle back up so that you can warm up the motor. Give it a few pumps of the gas. See? I idled. Then when you push it in, that idle comes down. And because the motor is not warmed, when you have that pushed in, it just shuts off. But that, uh, that's how that manual choke system works. Uh, when it comes to the Mustang, maybe a little carb tuning. Um, I know I have to bleed the brakes, they're a little soft, but I had to stop uh, working on it because the water pump down here behind this fan, I know you can't see it, but the weep hole on it that to that tells you when the front seal on the water pump is bad is pouring out so i had to order a water pump i also had to order a temperature sensor because the ones that come with the efi system won't work now i got a temperature system that's going to go into a hose it has a fitting and it has a sensor that goes in and runs to a separate gauge and hopefully that'll be the end of the 5.0 build and we could start drifting and sliding and racing and doing all the crazy stuff that you're used to seeing here on this channel. Today I'm gonna to be showing you guys how to install a universal water temperature gauge and to do this on the 5.0 Mustang. That's the carbureted swap that we did uh, from the Ford Explorer, the 2000. We're gonna need a gauge that comes with a sensor and then we're going to need this pipe that comes with the proper hole size and clamps to hook up the sensor because we're going to be putting this in the 
in one of the coolant lines instead of putting it in the manifold. There's a hole there that you put the sensor in. This is for your ground, so you put your ground wire on that. And um, hopefully I got the right size. This looks a bit small, but uh, should work. These are the clumps that I use to hold it down. Let's put this to the side. I love the uh, link in the description for the two of these parts because you can use this pretty much on any application. I think this is a D-Well or something like that. Aluminum something. But I'll have the, uh, the link in the description for this. Uh, especially this as well. And I believe that the two of these together didn't cost me, um, I think 20 bucks or something like that. So it's very inexpensive. Let me get this gauge out. The gauge has a pretty cool feature where um, it's blue most of the time. I don't know if you can see the, that uh, light. And then if the car runs hot or to a certain temperature, it, uh, the gauge will turn red uh, to tell you that it is running hot. So let's take off this uh, face so that we can get the gauge out. Uh, let's screw it out. All right, so let's take this out. And this is what you're gonna use to attach it to whatever in the car. Still gonna figure out how I'm gonna, um, where I'm gonna place it. But this is your wire harness for the back of the gauge, it clips in. And then you run your um, wires to this to give it power. And the most important part, this is your sensor. Let me show you how the sensor is going to be installed on this. Take your pipe, put the sensor down in it, screw it in, and this nut right up here, you're gonna take that nut off and you're gonna put a wire um, on, on this side, tighten it back down, and you send that wire, I believe it's this green wire here, on the, um, wire harness for the gauge and that gives it, that send tells it what temperature it is. Whilst the water passes through this, it uh, touches the sensor and sends the signal back to the gauge. So we're gonna see um, how accurate it is as well and um, how easy it is to install. Uh, should just be that we have to cut the hose in half and um, put this in the line. Let me see if I can get this to focus. There you go. So this is the 38 millimeter version. And like I said, it's very inexpensive to do. The reason why we have to install this on the Mustang is because we went from electronic fuel injection to carbureted and the sensor that was with the electronic fuel injection doesn't work unless you have a computer sending it five volts and then the sensor sends the voltage back to the computer and then the computer sends it back to the gauges or sends it to the gauge cluster. So we don't wanna have to deal with that system anymore. So we just got the gauge that's gonna meet the temperature in the water itself. All right guys, let's get outside and uh, start installing this. All right guys, this is what we're working on. This is a I believe this is a 96 Mustang. I'm really not sure of the year, but uh, it's that SN95 body that came with the 4.6. Um, and I have a 5.0 with a carburetor on top, HEI distributor, uh, manual choke. This is a Motocraft two barrel. And this is my top radiator hose. Um, what I did is I just cut it, put the clamps on, and now we're gonna be uh, mounting the pipe that's going to house the sensor. This is it here, that's the sensor installed. So let's get it mounted. Uh, the reason why I put it in the top pipe is because I want the temperature of the water coming out of the motor and not going into the motor because that'll give you a pretty inaccurate reading. So you want that pipe that uh, carries the water back to the radiator. Let's get this hose back on. There we go. That's one. 
Let's get these clamps tight. Got it nice and tight. All right. Now that it's uh, nice and tight on there, let me give you a look at it. The reason why I angled the sensor this way is just for hood clearance. I don't want it hitting the hood. We are going to now run a solid ground to this little bolt. And then we are going to run our uh, sensor wire from here through the firewall and um, onto, the, onto the gauge. So I'll go ahead and wire this up and come back and show you guys how I did it. All right, guys. Um, I have the wiring just mocked up right now. I don't have anything uh, solid or at least done properly. Just want to see if the gauge works um, and how it works. So I have this uh, green wire here that runs down, connects to a few other um, pieces of wire because I didn't have a wire long enough and goes right in the, that grommet there, right there. And that goes to the gauge. That's the signal wire from the sensor. The negative I just have running off this uh, small nut that goes down here to a ground on the motor. I'll show you the inside now. On the inside, we have the wire harness here for the gauge. I have the, like I said, the green wire is for the signal from the sensor. The black wire is the negative that I have here on a bolt on the inside on the chassis so it's grounded uh, this red wire I did not hook it up as yet because I wanted to show you guys this gauge wire and I have to feed this down to get this wire long enough to reach um, to my fuse box to put it on a 12 um, 12 volt on whenever the key is on so it'll only get power when the key is on so now that you guys have seen the wiring and how I wired up this uh, temp sensor and the gauge itself i'm going to connect this wire to a fuse that only gets power when the key is on and then i'll show you guys how the gauge works all right guys now we have the gauge completely installed we have the red wire for the ignition on ran to a fuse now we're going to be turning the key on so you can see what happens to the gauge and there you go starts out at 104 it has a red warning light uh, whenever the system I guess gets too hot and um, yeah that's how you completely install a water temperature gauge on any vehicle really it's very simple to do I think anytime that we hear about a Mustang we always want to know if it has a V8 in it so today I'm gonna to be showing you guys my 5.0 swapped 1996 Mustang GT Okay, first things first, a 96 Mustang GT came with a 4.6 liter V8 and I already, it, it, it came with that one and it had a lot of problems with it, it had a lot of wiring issues, um, the whole, um, what do you call that system, uh, the PAT system that stops the car from starting, had a lot of issues with that. So we just ended up swapping a 5.0 out of a Ford Explorer and that was a really good motor. Uh, but the keyway that connects the cam and the block to the cam gear itself broke through the motor off timing uh, And basically that number one piston just blew to shreds uh, because I was beating on the car really hard So this is it already it came with a 4.6 messed that one up put another 4.6 in it didn't get that one to start Put a 5.0 liter from the Ford Explorer in it blew that one up and now we have a 5.0 out of, um, I think it's a 94 Mustang, so the Fox body Mustang. 
but the catch to this one is we don't have any type of computer running anything this is a carbureted swap solely because I would have to basically rewire this entire car just to get that EFI system that comes on the 5.0 to work in this Mustang just because it came with a 4.6 so we have a Ford I think it's an 86 truck carbureted manifold also that same stock carburetor I just bought a new one it's a 2150 motorcraft runs really good doesn't give you that much power but like I said it runs really good uh, keeps the motor safe tuning is very easy so instead of talking you guys to that I'll now show you guys under the hood all right so super simple setup uh, I kept the EFI pump that comes in the tank I just bought me a small fuel pressure regulator that comes um, with that low PSI rating for carbureted systems and I think I have it set to about eight pounds don't mind this gauge the gauge doesn't work anymore um, the only issues I have left with this car is the alternator it needs to change I ordered one hopefully it should be here soon but like I said like I said it's an 86 truck manifold and that's a 2150 motorcraft carburetor this distributor is a hei distributor that i got from amazon fairly cheap very easy to wire up one wire for the battery one wire for the tack you can tell from the top here let me see if i can get that in so this is the battery wire that's the tack wire very simple to hook up uh, this is a vacuum advanced distributor that's actually what you need when you go carbureted and this is a shroud fan that's onto a, I think this is a four core radiator. Um, other than that, wiring wise, it was pretty simple. One wire from the starter to a button inside, one wire to the fuel pump, one wire to the distributor. I have the fan and also the excite wire for the alternator running off of the distributor's hot wire. And that doesn't take away from it at all. Let's get a battery in this thing and get it started up so you guys can hear it. Like I said, this one does run, it does drive really well, but the reason why it doesn't idle when it's cold is because I took out the entire choke. I was having a lot of issues with that manual choke, and I actually broke the linkage for the choke on the back end. Um, I was going to put an electronic choke on it so that it works flawlessly and doesn't have any issues, but I ended up breaking that linkage. So we don't have any choke. Whenever I want to drive it, I just get in and I start driving uh, when it warms up then it idles pretty good but let me show you guys how I start it up and what I have on a switch here we are so put the key in the ignition and let me turn these switches off so you know what they're for when I turn that key on you hear that beeping Okay, beeping has stopped. This is my temp gauge, it's aftermarket. I have it um, in the bottom hose for the radiator. This one will be for the fuel. This one will be for the distributor and the fan. And this one will be to start it. But if you notice, it doesn't start right away. So what I do is I give it one, two, three pumps of fuel, crank it. She shuts off but like I said that's normal that's because I don't have a choke installed on it all right guys that's basically it when it comes to my 96 uh, 5.0 swapped Mustang it's carbureted has a t5 transmission stock rear end stock gearing in the rear end um, four core radiator 2150 motorcraft carburetor fuel pressure regulator small things to pick up on eBay or Amazon and it's very easy to do um, anyone can do this really this is one of the easiest things I've ever done to a car 
Uh, it took some time to figure out just because not a lot of people do it because they can swap that EFI system over. But uh, if you want to get rid of all that security problems that you might have with any one of these Mustangs, this is the easiest way to go. Um, thank you guys so much for watching. If you do like videos like this, I have every single video that I've made a modification to this car or I've done something to this car right on my YouTube channel. And if you like things like this, consider subscribing. And that's about it, guys. All right, so today's video is gonna be about my uh, 96 Mustang that has a 5.0 swapped into it. Um, I'm having some issues with the trans brace. I believe I didn't install it right, so I'm gonna show you guys what I did and how to fix it. And in case any of you guys have any issues like this, uh, you might be able to fix it yourself just by uh, watching this video. So drop a like if this video does help you and let's get into it about to go under the car so i'm going to be using my gopro that's why the video quality and probably the audio changed but we have the car jacked up i just have it resting on four dummy tires so it doesn't go anywhere it has the e-brake up and i'm going to show you now what i mean by i installed this brace improperly if you notice the bolt is still hanging out i didn't notice that before and it didn't go all the way through it's supposed to be on this side because this let me, give, let me get you a better angle this is the entire brace for the car um, and then this is the brace for the transmission the bolt is supposed to go through the two supposed to go through this wall the brace and this second wall here and then bolt on the other side for some reason I feel like I, I just uh, that slipped my mind so just to make you aware the trans brace that I'm using is a solid mount trans brace so we don't have that flexibility of when you're using a rubber brace I also have a solid engine mount as well that's here so there's no rubber braces in this car for mounting the engine or the tranny that's what made this so hard and probably what made me think that that's where that was supposed to be but I have a crowbar some symbol hand tools here and I'm gonna start by taking this bolt out and trying my best to align this way I could get the bolt through the two sides and that should be all that we have to do today to get the box to stop moving from left to right because obviously with it sitting like this it's just flex flexing this plate is why it's moving so I'm gonna take that bolt out and try to get it as best aligned in here and then I'll come back and record the uh, results so um, I used the jack to brace the tranny for when I took this uh, bolt out and I used a bottleneck jack to carry the brace up because it was lopsided. Um, I'm assuming because we don't have that playroom um, because we have the solid mount um, that this was needed but I used a maul and I hit this side back in and from this side you should be able to see what's the end result. Um, Basically, you have to get that bolt through this side, the mount, and the other side. And then it has like a, a lock nut or washer on the other side that holds it in place. So now I shouldn't get that play or I shouldn't feel the gearbox moving around. Also, I found out that the bolts under here were slack. I could turn my uh, gearbox bolts with my finger, so I had to tighten those up and um, hopefully when we drive it now it doesn't give any issues but you're gonna need two jacks to do this job just to align it properly and you're gonna need a maul and a crowbar um, yeah so other than that uh, we just gotta drive it now to make sure that everything is uh, fine with it and we don't feel any um, type of play in it anymore
Alright, so I forgot to do an outro for this video on the day that I actually recorded it, so it's the day after. And uh, just giving a bit of advice on having solid mounts. Uh, it's not a good idea for someone that's just going to be dailying the car or driving it every now and again. Now for me who's just going to be using it um, in drifting videos or burnouts or sliding around a roundabout or something like that, it's kind of fine. But what I figured out is every week or so I'm gonna have to be tightening up those mounting bolts um, even the bolts that connect the bell housing to the gearbox itself were extremely loose and even though I tightened them up um, I'm pretty sure they're gonna come back slack because I tightened those up before so having solid mounts all that vibration all the harshness actually has to go somewhere and those transmission mounts look like they're taking the most beaten so even if you do get solid motor mounts do not get solid transmission mounts it's not a good idea especially in a 5.0 especially being carbureted there's going to be more of that um, vibration throughout the car so it's not a good idea um, hopefully this video helps you um, if it does please drop a thumbs up uh, consider subscribing if this is the type of content that you guys usually watch all right, so the first thing we're gonna wanna do is um, to remove the old 2G alternator. And you're gonna need an 1116, at least that's what my own is, to release the tension from the belt. Just like that. All right, now I'm gonna be taking off the wiring from the alternator. This is gonna be different uh, because my own is carbureted, so I just put a bunch of uh, connectors on the end of my wires so yours might look different if your car is um, electronically fuel injected let me see if I could get can't get to that one so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna lose the top bolt from this to get to the next connector there we go this bolt size is gonna be different for you guys as well because I mix matched a lot of these bolts so we're just gonna put that back into itself secure that all right so we're gonna take off the lower bolt now and that's a 15 on my own like I said this is gonna be different for everyone else back it out stubborn all right that's the last bolt that holds that in this is extremely hot so I'm gonna get a rag There you go. This is your old style uh, 2G alternator. You can tell by the clips. You can tell by the external fan. And now I'm going to be showing you the new um, 3G alternator that I got for. This is the newest style uh, 3G alternator. Pretty much the same mounting um, bolts. The wiring is going to be slightly different. I'm going to show you that in a moment. But I'm going to get this installed. I believe there's going to be some type of modification that I have to cut out here to get this to fit. I'm not sure. So I'm just going to do it and then show you guys what I've done. Okay, important step. Um, when installing this 3G alternator, um, the bottom bolt is going to bolt up perfectly. But this top bolt is going to be an issue. And I'm going to show you why. I had to... Um, cut 
this little notch out of the original bracket shouldn't do anything to the strength um, but because 3G alternator bucks on the housing or bucks on the bracket you just need to make enough of a notch to fit that bolt and I guess that piece of the housing um, you could now get it right where you need to which should be like right there yeah right there and then you notice you still have a good amount of clearance but you're gonna have to do this whenever you're installing a 3G alternator. I'm gonna bolt this up and get it wired up and then explain to you guys how I wired this up. Okay, so this is the final product. Um, makes everything else in this engine bay look extremely old. <laughs> but it's bolted into place. Now, let me explain this wiring. Um, it's best, let me get my phone. There are A, S, and I terminals. Let me see if I get that to focus. Right there, A, S, and I terminals. This green one, let me read, show you it as I read it. This green one here goes to an ignition source. This red one I ran underneath, um, and that goes to this terminal right here by itself. This yellow one goes here to where the charge is sent back to the battery. And this is my thicker battery cable there. There is a negative or a ground right here that I'm supposed to put on, so I'll go put that on. Okay, so we now have that uh, ground wire that I was telling you about on. I just have it right here to the chassis. Now we're gonna start it up and see how it runs. key out this is gonna be pretty loud so I'm gonna turn it off uh, after I know that everything is running pretty good the voltage was right in the middle right in the middle of the uh, volt gauge before with the 2G alternator it usually sit right around 9 and that was really bad so whenever you had to run lights or even the fan it would just go dead on you all right basically that's it that's how you install a 3G alternator um, especially going from 2G to 3G that's how you wire it up and that's how you would do it on any old Ford 5.0 or 3.8. Uh, any vehicle that actually has a 2G or even a 1G alternator, the 3G alternator is an extremely good alternator to get, especially if you're gonna run um, electronic fans or a better fuel pump or even um, bigger speakers or uh, brighter headlights, anything that's gonna draw power, a 3G alternator is absolutely a must. Uh, if this video helped you at all, make sure to drop a like and if you like videos like this, make sure to subscribe and turn on post notifications so you don't miss a video.